A joint Iron Maiden and Judas Priest tour is every heavy metal fan's dream. Yes. Although, of course, we are a bit worried that if they're ever on the same stage... The universe will implode! But in reality, Judas Priest and Iron Maiden did go on the road together, and not once, but three years in a row. And as you might have imagined, those tours became crucial in the history of heavy metal. Although, ironically, all of them were very different one from another. <laughs> By 1980, Judas Priest were untouchable, with a newly developed leather and studs look and the first heavy metal live album to break the charts across the globe, Priest basically became the personification of heavy metal, and not only in the United Kingdom, but also far beyond Europe, and especially in the United States. At the same time, encouraged by the success of Sabbath and Priest, the new wave of British heavy metal bands was rising at the underground clubs of the United Kingdom, with one of them particularly standing out from the rest and getting ready to tear the world apart with their upcoming debut record. Rock and roll! And so, despite the fact that Iron Maiden had just finished the Metal for Mothers tour, playing clubs around England with fellow new wave of British heavy metal bands, when the opportunity for the first major arena run with then already huge countrymates arose, they immediately jumped at it. Welcome, your very own Iron Maiden, come on! <laughs> As for Iron Maiden, who by then haven't even released their debut record yet, this was more than a huge opportunity they simply could not have missed. And we all know they made just the right choice. By the way guys, only around 30% of the people who are watching my videos are actually subscribed to the Metal Pilgrim channel. So if you haven't done so yet, and especially if this is not your first Up the Irons or Defenders of the Faith video you're watching, please consider doing it right now. We're gonna have a good time. Always. But anyways, the March 1980 UK run in fact became somewhat of a pre-tour for both of the bands, as neither the groundbreaking British Steel nor the Iron Maiden self-titled debut album have been out yet. And while you couldn't really tell it from the songs Maiden played live, you know, simply because of the fact they didn't have that many of those in their catalog yet. It's just, it's outrageous. It was very much reflected in Priest's set list, for although this was a part of the British Steel World Tour, the band still hasn't played almost any songs from the British Steel album on this leg of the tour. Although, if we're being very honest, this actually might have been a part of a larger marketing plan, which eventually helped both of those bands. weeks before the tour's start, a London PR agent, Tony McBrain, who, as far as I know, has nothing to do with Iron Maiden's future drummer, Nick McBrain, whom we all, of course, dearly love. Welcome, boys and girls. How are you? Fabricated a story that the master tapes for the Judas Priest's upcoming studio album have been stolen from the New York City recording studio and held for ransom, and that now Judas Priest were on a crossroads whether to pay close to $100,000 to the thieves to get their tapes back or cancel their upcoming UK tour and go back to the studio and re-record British Steel and you. And while this story of course was totally fabricated by Tony, several major music publications actually ran it, stating that although advised by the American police to not do so, because of the love for their own fans, Judas Priest still decided to pay off the thieves to not upset the fans and not cancel any of the upcoming tour dates. And although their British tour will go on as scheduled, at least part of it sadly will not be supported by the new album. Seriously, what an utter load of bollocks! Another indication of a tour in between became the fact that this run actually became the last tour in the history of Iron Maiden to not feature a walking Eddie on stage of an Iron Maiden show, who by then was simply unfamiliar to most of the band's fans. Well, 
I guess technically Iron Maiden's mascot has already made his debut, since the band's first ever single, Running Free, was released on the 8th of February that same year, so just a couple of weeks before the start of this tour, and its artwork of course does feature the legendary Eddie on it. Yet at the same time on this one he still remains in shadows and could have easily been mistaken with a random person. Exactly. And by then of course no one had any idea that this guy in the back of an artwork of a single Running Free will eventually become possibly the most recognizable face in the history of heavy metal. <laughs> One thing which always bothered me about the running free artwork resulting in me creating all the crazy theories in my head was this hand, which let's be honest here, does look like Eddie's hand quite a lot. And so maybe, just maybe, the guy on the cover actually does not run from Eddie himself, but rather from an Eddie impersonator, only to get in the hands of a real Eddie, who will of course make his first appearance in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, I know I'm overthinking it way too much. Here I go. Oh, and by the way, another part of this artwork, which let's not forget, was released just shortly after this tour has been announced, and which does relate to it and this video quite a lot, is of course the writings on the wall at the back, and specifically the band's names. One of which, of course, is the name of the band Iron Maiden were about to go on a tour in support of. <laughs> Anyways, it is of course such marketing stories like the stolen tapes one, or like the writing on the back of the running free artwork, together with an enormous success of Unleashed in the East, and an unexpected triumph of Metal for Mother's tour, which boosted the fans' anticipation of this tour through the roof, resulting in thousands of boys and girls all across the United Kingdom lining up to see the two British bands which were about to take on the world of heavy metal. So our voices can be heard, and together we will take on all the world! A common misconception among many casual fans is that this tour resulted in a terrible feud between Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, which goes on until today. When this is not exactly true. Okay, this is not at all true. While Judas Priest were busy finalizing the recording of British Steel back at Ringo Starr studio, Iron Maiden vocalist Paul Diana gave an interview to one local music paper in which, talking about the upcoming tour with Judas Priest, he said that Iron Maiden will do their best to blow their better known countrymates off the stage. Just like that. And then we have two absolutely different interpretations of what happened next. According to Rob Halford, pretty much everyone at the Judas Priest camp absolutely loved this statement, as first of all, Paul Diana said exactly what a young and ambitious musician should say, and if anything that just meant that Judas Priest found a right band to go on road with, a band who will not just walk up on stage with their knees shaken, but instead will put out a great performance, electrifying the stage and bringing something new to the show, which will of course eventually result in higher ticket sales. And secondly, well, this is exactly what Judas Priest have been saying and doing to other bands they went on the road with before that. So it was about time that someone said that about them this time. And especially since, in reality, such statements only show that the band is actually serious about what they do. Most of the priest boys simply had a laugh at what they just read. There was one guy who wasn't really amused by this statement. Hello, everybody. I'm KK Downing of uh, Judas Priest. It's mm -hmm. nice to be here. The band's founding member and then guitarist KK Downing actually saw this comment as an insult and simply went furious about it, even to the point of raising a question of dropping Iron Maiden as a support act for this leg of the tour. Can you believe that? He, of course, has been outvoted by the rest of the boys who had zero problems with what Paul said. Even Paul 
who makes out to be very loud and obnoxious, isn't it at all, he's a sweetheart, really. In fact, according to Rob Halford, during that time, Kenneth felt that same level of animosity towards the entire new wave of British heavy metal movement, as if he was slightly worried that those bands would get the same level of recognition without all the hardships he personally had to go through several years ago. When the rest of the boys felt more vindicated by this movement, they saw it as a validation of everything they and other bands did in the 1970s, proving to everyone around the world that heavy metal is not just a random thing that will pass away very very soon and is here to stay forever. But anyways, Kiki Down and actually mentioned that later on Paul Diana reached out to him and apologized for what he said that time in the media. And the two did not only put that grudge behind them long time ago, but Paul Diana is actually going to open for Kiki Downing's new band Kiki's Priest's first ever show, which I'm more than sure will be a kick-ass show by now to good friends. And if we're being very honest, I actually don't think that it was that serious in the first place since let's be honest here if it was judas priest and iron maiden most likely would not have gone on road together once again next year and then a year after that yeah! But for now, the story goes that back in 1980, Kenneth actually did not let go of that grudge throughout the entire tour. Can you believe that? Well, the rest of the boys, of course, got along just fine. Actually, they got along so fine that on one of those nights that they were getting insanely drunk together, Rob Halford actually tried to seduce Iron Maiden vocalist Paul Diaz. Yet after having all those shots, he was too drunk to try anything, and Paul was too drunk to even notice Rob wanted to. The tour itself was pretty much the culmination of the entire heavy metal scene of the United Kingdom of that period. It both solidified heavy metal's success of the past and also showed British fans that they should not worry about heavy metal's future, for it is in good hands. Thus, of course, it was just full of Spinal Tap moments, whether it was Judas Priest going on to perform at Top of the Pops, to almost miss their own concert at their hometown, second year in a row. We can do it, we can do it, and if they wanna, they can try, but they'll never get here. Paul Diana getting absolutely wasted before the show and throwing stuff at the audience, bouncers at some venues trying to tame the crowd, and expected all of those heavy metal maniacs who came out to see the two bands instead of headbanging sit down, stay still, and clap politely. Yeah, that actually happened during their show in Bristol. And from the bootleg available, it sounds like it was absolutely unsuccessful. Or Glenn Titton getting an electric shock from his microphone during a show in Sheffield City Hall until he finally got so pissed off that he threw his guitar in the crowd, pushed all of his amp down so that some of his guitars broke in half, and walked off from the stage in anger, only to find out that the band did not stop and continued playing, and actually sounded quite good even without him. <laughs> Yet the highest point of their joint run of course became the last night of this leg of the tour. On the 1st of April 1980, the band performed at the legendary Rainbow Theatre in London. On the night which technically marked the first day of the Iron Maiden tour in support of their upcoming debut record. And since it was their last show in the United Kingdom as a supporting act that year, according to people who witnessed it, the band put out an absolutely insane performance. Yes, it's true. And after that, when Judas Priest took over the stage, they showed once again that not only punk rockers can do crazy stuff during their concerts, as during the final anchor, after an absolutely insane set list, Rob Halford first ran to the crowd to mosh with fellow metal maniacs, after which towards the end of the song he finally got up on stage and dropped his trousers and underwear in front of a fully packed rainbow theater. And of course, all of those events which were discussed in colors by all of the music media in the United Kingdom and beyond only added to the hype around heavy metal in general and particularly around the two albums, twin albums, which will be released just a couple of days after the end of this lag.
4 released on the third week of April, British Steel and Iron Maiden, both of which by the way reached number 4 in the UK charts, changed the course of the heavy metal history forever, allowing both bands go on the road once again together next year, but this time in a completely different status, for which I'll be more than happy to speak in one of our next crossover episodes between Up the Irons and Defenders of the Faith series, if you don't mind. But anyways, what do you guys personally think? Is it possible that Iron Maiden and Judas Priest tour once again together before the end of their careers? Please let us know in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching guys and thank you so much for all your support you're showing to me, this show in Ukraine through this very, very difficult time. Just know that your support means the world to me and all Ukrainian metalheads. We will prevail. Slava Ukraini!